Today on Inside the Issues, I speak with Dr. Rhoda Howard Hassman on the subject of human rights in North Korea. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. My name is Dr. Andrew Thompson. I'm an adjunct assistant professor of political science at the University of Waterloo and program officer at the Balsley School of International Affairs. Every week on the program, we're joined by an expert in global governance, international public policy, or some other aspect of global affairs. Today, my guest is Dr. Rhoda Howard Hassman. She is the Canada Research Chair in International Human Rights based at Wilfrid Laurier University. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Today, we're going to talk about the human rights situation in North Korea. Um, for our audience, could you just describe in very broad terms what the situation is? Well, there aren't any human rights, to put, blunt, put it bluntly. North Korea is a totalitarian state, which means that every aspect of the lives of the citizens until very recently has been completely regulated by the government. Its official ideology is something called, I don't know how to pronounce it, but Juche, which is self-reliance. Um, that's supposed to mean that it doesn't need any outside help. In fact, it has relied in the past very strongly on the former Soviet Union and China for support. It has uh, collectivized agriculture. Until very recently, no private industry or private enterprise whatsoever. All aspects of, of citizens' lives are regulated by the government. But it's also a form of hereditary monarchy. So it was established in 1948 under uh, Kim Il-sung. He died in 94. His son Kim Jong-il took over. He died in, in 2011 and his son Kim Jong-un took over. So three Kims, grandfather, father, and son. Right. And people are trained to worship um, these leaders as if they are god kings. For example, you have to have pictures of the leaders in your apartment, in your office. Um, whenever anything happens, it's good. You have to thank the leaders. Whenever anything happens, it's bad. You should not criticize the leader or you probably will end up in a concentration camp. Right. Um, and building on this point of the hereditary monarchy, has anything changed under the current government of King Jong Un or has it basically, with respect to human rights, has it basically been more of the same? It's more of the same. When he came in, I think commentators thought that he might loosen up the economy. But recently, he executed his uncle. His uncle was sort of a de facto regent. That is, we thought that since Kim Jong-un is so young, he's only about 31 now, as far as we know, we thought that his uncle would be more or less his tutor until he established himself. And it looked as if his uncle was open to reforms of the same kind that China instituted after 1979, moving away from a co completely collectivized economy to a more open um, sort of quasi-market economy. But he's had his uncle executed, and I think not only his uncle, but something like 120 members of his uncle's entourage and family. So it looks as if he's consolidating his power, or has consolidated it, uh, in a way that would suggest he's not going to adopt market-oriented reforms. Right. At the same time, however, North Korea has been opening up unofficially in the last 10 years or so. Um, there was a famine in the 1990s. There is still very severe hunger. Many people go back and forth across the border to China to trade illegally, but they go, they sell, I don't know what, artifacts or pieces of copper that they steal from factories in China and bring back goods. Also with the uh, electronic revolution, more and more people in North Korea have access to cell phones, even though they're strictly controlled and illegal, and uh, to DVDs. They may just be a DVD, some about some silly movie from South Korea or the United States, but right. this gives them some idea of what the outside world is like. Right. Um, now, you've done a lot of research on North Korea. Could you say a little bit about, uh, about your projects? 
Okay, I want to specify first of all that I'm not a North Korea expert. I have never been to North or South Korea. Mm -hmm. I do not speak Korean. Mm -hmm. I got interested in North Korea as part of a larger project I'm doing on the right to food, where I'm looking at various ways in which countries deliberately, recklessly, or by incompetence end up denying their citizens the right to food. So North Korea is one of five countries I'm looking at. The others are um, Zimbabwe in Africa, Venezuela in South America, the Pal occupied Palestinian territories, and Canada. Um, North Korea is the worst case. It is a case of a government intentionally and recklessly denying their people the right to food. Right. Was there anyth anything about your, in your research findings that surprised you? I think the only thing that surprised me was how awful it is in North Korea. I had known before I started that there was a famine in North Korea. The popular figure was that 3 million people out of 22 million people died during that famine in the 1990s. Turned out to be somewhat less, uh, more conservative academic figures say between about 600,000 and 1.1 million people died, but that's still 3 to 5 percent of the population. It was horrendous to read about people starving, children starving, children abandoned by their parents because they couldn't feed them, instances of cannibalism because people were starving so much that they lost all their moral constraints and were only interested in food. Um, and the other thing is the terrible conditions in the North Korean prison camps, which are kind of a combination of the Soviet Union's Gulag and Auschwitz. They're absolutely horrendous. Right. And one of the horrendous things about these camps is that if you are deemed to have committed a crime against the regime and you are, say, a 33-year-old man, it's not only you that goes to prison. It's your wife, your children, your parents, your brothers and sisters. Their policy is that criminals are three, three generational family criminals. Thank you very much. Um, when we come back for the next segment, I'd like to talk about the international community's response to the human rights uh, situation in North Korea. We will be back in a moment with Dr. Rhoda Howard Hassman. You've been watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitter. Welcome back. Rhoda, as you know, the UN has just released a fairly damning report of the human rights situation in North Korea, in which the Commission of Inquiry that was responsible for the report went as far as to say that crimes against humanity are, are being committed. Um, could you tell our audience a little bit about the report and then what your impressions of it uh, are? Well, this is a commission of inquiry which was established by the UN Human Rights Council, which is a council of, you know better than I, the number of countries. But a lot of these countries are well-known human rights abusers themselves. So I'm, I don't think much of this council. But in this case, the crimes, the human rights abuses are so horrendous that I think even the worst human rights abusers on this council felt secure in commissioning a report. The report doesn't say anything that academics and scholars haven't known for 10 years or right. longer, and activists haven't right. known. But it's very important that a UN Commission of Inquiry now has put its stamp on, on these um, crimes and called them crimes against humanity. And it's done so after having had hearings uh, where individuals testified about what they had experienced these hearings couldn't take place in North Korea, obviously, nor could they take place in China, where there were, were many, many, perhaps 200,000 refugees from North Korea living illegally. But they had them in places such as South Korea. And what the report says is that the uh, North Korean regime commits practically every crime against humanity in the book. This includes things like slavery, rape, uh, illegal executions, um, and denial of food, and, and many more. But the only thing it doesn't mention 
is cannibalism, which uh, takes place occasionally, as I said earlier. Some people might have wanted it to go a little stronger and said that North Korea, say that North Korea is committing genocide, but genocide is very hard to prove. Right. There are two groups of populations in North Korea that might be considered to be victims of genocide. One is religious believers. The estimate is that 400,000 religious believers have been killed in North Korea for their beliefs. Most of them, I would imagine, Christian. The other is this peculiar phenomenon of children of North Korean mothers and Chinese fathers. These are women who go to, North, to China as refugees, either voluntarily or marry a Chinese man or are coerced into marrying a Chinese man or are coerced into uh, trafficking, prostitution. Then they're captured and sent back to North Korea. When they are sent back, if it's early in the pregnancy, they have forced abortions. If it's late in the pregnancy, there's an induced delivery, and then the children are murdered. Hmm. So it's what one author called ethnic infanticide. For, but for the rest, it's the, the best way to describe it is crimes against humanity. And the evidence is overwhelming that these crimes uh, take place. Um, so extermination, murder, enslavement, torture, imprisonment, rape, forced abortions, um, enforced disappearances, and knowingly causing starvation. Wow. Now, the, re the report also advocated uh, that the situation be referred to the International Criminal yes. Court. How significant is that recommendation? I think it's quite significant uh, for a number of reasons. I've been advocating this, and so have other have legal scholars. I'm not a legal scholar myself. It's significant, first of all, because it says that Kim Jong-un, who's only been in power for two years and a bit, and other leaders, government, military, and so on, are, they are saying they're directly responsible for these crimes. Right. So they know about these crimes. The report suggests they have evidence that these people are responsible for them. So that's a very significant thing to do, to say that the crimes are so horrendous that the International Criminal Court should be judging these people as individuals. The other reason it's significant is because if it happens, it would be the first referral outside of Africa. Right. So that is good for the International Criminal Court's reputation because it's supposed to be an international court. In order for this to happen, however, it has to go to the United Nations Security Council because the um, North Koreans are not party to the treaty which established the International Criminal Court. They can only be judged for crimes that have occurred since 2002 right. because that's the remit or the mandate of the International Criminal Court, so not for the famines of the 1990s. Um, the UN Security Council would have to vote for this, and the big question would be whether China would be willing to vote for such a referral. My guess at the moment is no. No. Um, so building on that then, um, does the recommendation essentially, is it a symbolic gesture then? Or is there, could there actually be some teeth behind it? I think at the moment it's a symbolic gesture, but an important one. Even the North Koreans may be concerned about their reputation and wish to present something of a false picture of what they actually do right. uh, to the outside world. It's possible that in the future China would become sufficiently irritated with them that it would threaten to vote for this. China's irritation stems from the fact that the North Koreans have conducted three nuclear tests close to China. Chinese citizens have some say now in what goes on in China, and they're not too happy with these nuclear tests. Um, also, North Korea is very expensive to China. It's expensive because it has refugees that it doesn't want in the northeast part, and it's expensive because it has to prop up the economy, the North Korean economy. Right. right. Thank you very much, Rhoda. For the next section, I would like to come back to the question of China's involvement uh, in
North Korea and specifically its, its role in the perpetuation of the human rights violations. We will be back in a moment with Dr. Rhoda Howard Hassman. You have been watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us online at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitter. Welcome back. Rhoda, I'd like to pick up on our last discussion and specifically, specifically focus on China and its role in uh, contributing or supporting the, the human rights violations that are taking place in North Korea. Could you say a little bit more about China's relationship with North Korea um, and how this is implicating the, the human rights situation? Well, originally China was a strong supporter of North Korea and was one of the reasons that the regime could uh, survive despite the fact that it wasn't producing any goods and it didn't produce enough food and so on. China was supplying both food and uh, oil at very low prices to North Korea till about the mid 1990s. And then I think the Chinese leaders became irritated with some of the North Korean policies and decided not to give them so much aid. Currently, I understand there's an internal debate in China about what to do. So some people are willing to continue supporting North Korea the way it is, and others would like to lean on North Korea to change its policies. Now, again, as I said, one reason is the North Korean nuclear tests the first two nuclear tests resulted in sanctions from the UN Security Council for which China did not vote. Right. The last nuclear test, China voted along with uh, the other Security Council people for the sanctions. So these, these sanctions are not against the entire population. They are against the elites. They prevent officially importation of weapons and of luxury goods that the elite uses. So the fact that China voted for those sanctions is some indication that it is uh, not completely pleased with North Korea. It did try to encourage Kim Jong-un's Kim Jong -un's father, Kim Jong-il, to see what kinds of reforms had gone on in China. And uh, it has, I believe, been trying to encourage Kim Jong-un in that direction, but so far as far as we know, without success. Um, so the nuclear thing is one big thing. The other issues are the refugees. As right. I said, the more refugees there are in China, the more that imposes burdens on China. But China does see North Korea as a sort of ally, which is a bulwark against South Korea and Japan. So in that respect, it might like to the North Korea to continue as an independent state. Um, and through North Korea, it has access to the Sea of Japan, across from Japan. So that's useful for China in its rivalry with Japan. So on the one hand, it probably doesn't like the current policies. On the other, it wants to maintain North Korea as an ally. And broadening out, how have countries like South Korea or the United States reacted to uh, essentially uh, the human rights situation in North Korea, but also China's role in perpetuating well, it. The Americans go back and forth, as do the South Koreans, between the carrot and the stick, or what we might call con uh, engagement and containment. Sometimes they try to punish the North Koreans by withholding aid. Other times they think, well, if we give them aid, we try to talk to them, maybe the situation will change a bit. In 2013, the Americans had um, offered, I think, 540 million tons of food. Wow. I, I may not be right on the figure, uh, to North Korea. So that was a, an engagement tactic. But they did it on, on condition that North Korea stop its nuclear tests. And then North Korea tested another nuclear bomb. So they said, OK, you're not getting the food. Right. Um, they are concerned about. North Koreans' conventional weapons as well, which might, if they couldn't hit the West Coast, might nevertheless be able to hit Hawaii, um, North Korean missile testing, and so on. 
Uh, the North Koreans also engage in the international drug trade. Their, their diplomats are really drug runners, mm. and they earn hard currency, which they then take back to North Korea for their leaders to use to buy luxury goods. Uh, the North Koreans also uh, uh, counterfeit U.S. dollars. So there are those kinds of concerns that the Americans have as well. Right. And um, uh, on the question of the nuclear, uh, North Korea's nuclear weapons program, uh, you have written that, or, or the, many have observed that, in fact, until the nuclear question is resolved, everything else is, is secondary. Well, I think that for many people that is the case that this, this is a hard security question, and it takes priority over what we call human security, which is a very soft security question right. in comparison. Military people are mostly concerned, and I, I would imagine governments are mostly concerned with that question. Now, South Korea, of course, has to worry about just conventional weapons as well, um, and the possibility, however remote, that North Korea might invade using uh, conventional weapons. But I think that always takes priority. If there were no nuclear weapons, then maybe countries like the uh, United States would just impose a huge range of sanctions. I don't know. I don't know whether right. they would be more likely to be punitive or more likely to try to engage if there were no nuclear weapons. And I don't think anybody knows that. There supposedly have been six party talks on the nuclear question going on since 1993 between North Korea, South Korea, Japan, China, Russia, and the United States. But the North Koreans will break them off. They're completely unpredictable. They join the Nuclear Non-Proliferation non Treaty, and then they unjoined the Nuclear uh, Non-Proliferation Treaty. So they're very unpredictable people. Um, they are, in effect, uh, what political scientists call a rogue state, because right. they're unpredictable. Right. Thank you very much. For the last section, I'd like to pick up on this point uh, and, and explore, essentially, what are the, the available options to the international community for dealing with, with the North Korean question. We'll be back in a moment with Dr. Rhoda Howard Hassman. You've been watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us online at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitter. Welcome back. Rhoda, for the last section, uh, I'd like to shift the focus of the discussion a little bit. And up until now, we've essentially talked about state reactions to the human rights situation in North Korea. What are civil society actors saying about it or, or even doing about it? Well, there's quite a lot of activity based in South Korea, some of which is actually illegal. Um, well, sorry, it requires illegal actions in, in North Korea and, the, um, and China. So, okay, first of all, there are people who try to rescue uh, people from, South, from North Korea. And these refugees cross from northwest North, North Korea into northeast China, across the Tumen River. There are estimates to be about 200,000 people there. The Chinese don't want them. And if they find them, they send them back. So there's, there are people who go in to China and help the refugees get out, which means taking them all the way through from North China, through South China, through Southeast Asia, eventually to Thailand. If they get to Thailand, they can go to the, the South Korean embassy. All North Koreans, by law, are considered to be South Korean citizens. So if they can get to the South Korean embassy, then they can get to South Korea. So there's about 25,000 of them now in South Korea. Then there are, of course, people who are smugglers. You have to pay those people. Right. And this is a very interesting ethical question. If they can't get you out without you paying them, are they criminals? Or are they just charging you for expenses? Then there are a lot of Christian groups, uh, mainly based in South Korea, who again will try, n try to help refugees get out. They also try to send information into North Korea, of the kind I've told you about before, DVDs, um, cell phones, and so on. 
Uh, and they're not all necessarily Christian. I met a North Korean refugee who fled after he read leaflets that had been sent over the border by the wind, I think, to North Korea uh, that told him something about what was really going on in the world. Mm. And his job was to send over lightweight balloons and they just use the wind. They can't send a plane over. So they send over these lightweight balloons. The balloons themselves are covered with information in, Kore in Korean. And in the balloon, there were very lightweight DVD players. And the DVD players are full of information about South Korea and the rest of the world. Wow. So I met this man about two years ago. And already the North Koreans had sent agents into South Korea to try to assassinate him. Right. So I don't know what's happened since then. So there are Christian and non-Christian uh, organizations which are really trying to send in information. And that seems to be the biggest thing you can do, is just tell the North Koreans what the world is really like. So that, because they are filled with propaganda th through their entire lives. For example, during the famine, and probably still now, starving children, five-year-old children in kindergartens were taught to, to sing a song called Nothing to Envy. And that is a song that says, no one, we, there's nothing that we envy about the rest of the world because our world is so perfect. Right. So you have to have a lot of de-propaganda <laughs> going on. Right. Now, um, I think it's, it's safe to say that naming and shaming doesn't have much of an effect, if any, on the government in North Korea. What about shaming China and as a strategy for having some kind of movement on the North Korean situation. Is this happening? Okay, well, first of all, I just want to finish my answer to your last question, sure. which was uh, a lot of these refugee women in China are being trafficked, right. forced to, to marry Chinese men or into uh, uh, as sex workers. So there are a lot of NGOs that are concerned with this as well. As for naming and shaming, um, I think that probably you're right, that would have very little effect on the North Koreans themselves. But I think the Chinese do want to have a good international reputation. And therefore, I think the best way, if you were an individual, to act for the human rights of North Koreans, other than giving money, say, to organizations, is to write letters to the Chinese embassy saying, essentially saying, I'm shocked. I mean, the Chinese are, as I always say, an ancient civilization. Chinese people are doing well economically now. The Chinese have made many admirable reforms in the last 30 years. So you write them a letter and say, why are you supporting this appalling regime? The Chinese themselves are just now getting rid of their own uh, so-called work labor re-education camps, I believe. The North Koreans have these the worst camps ever known, where people are deliberately fed sub-starvation rations, where they are mutilated, executed. I met a prison guard who now works with activists against the regime who talked about participating in a sport where human beings, prisoners, would be tied to a pole and then the guards would practice their, their karate moves mm. on these people. He talked about witnessing dogs eating up little tiny children who were in the prison. Um, when you hear these stories, I mean, even the Chinese don't send children into prison. This is probably the worst regime in the world. And the Chinese don't need to support that kind of thing. Right. Just to conclude then, do you, can you foresee anything changing in the near future? Or is this despite the international attention, despite the sanctions, despite the civil society involvement, um, things are, are basically going to remain the same for the foreseeable future. I haven't got a clue. Uh, a couple of years ago, I attended a seminar at the Canadian Forces College of very high-level American and Chinese and South Korean officials, some of whom were generals and colonels. They, this was before Kim um, Jong-il died. And they were very worried about civil war breaking out. They were very worried that um, after he died, it would be a collapsed state or a failed state, which would mean many, many more refugees right. going to China. Um, and I asked them, well, who would be fighting who? And they said, we don't know. These were Korean speakers, military experts. They said, we don't know. 
We don't know which faction it would be, if it would be military versus government, or perhaps his uncle's faction, but he's, he's now, uh, the uncle has now been executed, versus the young Kim Jong-un's Jong faction. We don't know. I asked him if they could, about what I called the Belarus option, a denuclearized, extremely poor country. Right. Maybe that would be a possibility, but no one seems to have enough knowledge. Rhoda, we'll end there, but it's been absolutely fascinating, uh, our discussion. And thank you so much for, for being on the show. Thank you. And thank you to our audience. Uh, please join us again for another episode of Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us online at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitter. are regulated by the government, but it's also a form of hereditary monarchy. So it was established in 1948 under uh, Kim Il-sung. He died in 94. His son Kim Jong-il took over. He died in, in 2011 and his son Kim Jong-un took over. So three Kims, grandfather, father, and son. And people are trained to worship um, these leaders as if they are god kings. For example, you have to have pictures of the leaders in your apartment, in your office. Um, whenever anything happens, it's good. You have to thank the leaders. Whenever anything happens, it's bad. You should not criticize the leader or you probably will end up in a concentration camp. Right. Um. And building on this point of the hereditary monarchy, has anything changed under the current government of King Jong Un, or has it basically, with respect to human rights, has it basically been more of the same? It's more of the same. When he came in, I think commentators thought that he might loosen up the economy. But recently, he experienced state, which means that every aspect of the lives of the citizens, until very recently, has been completely regulated by the government. Its official ideology is something called, I don't know how to pronounce it, but juche, which is self-reliance. Um, that's supposed to mean that it doesn't need any outside help. In fact, it has relied in the past very strongly on the former Soviet Union and China for support. It has uh, collectivized agriculture. Until very recently, no private industry or private enterprise whatsoever. All aspects of, of citizens' lives Today on Inside the Issues, I speak with Dr. Rhoda Howard Hassman on the subject of human rights in North Korea. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, a CG online podcast. My name is Dr. Andrew Thompson. I'm an adjunct assistant professor of political science at the University of Waterloo and program officer at the Balsley School of International Affairs. Every week on the program, we're joined by an expert in global governance, international public policy, or some other aspect of global affairs. Today, my guest is Dr. Rhoda Howard Hassman. She is the Canada Research Chair in International Human Rights based at Wilfrid Laurier University. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Today, we're going to talk about the human rights situation in North Korea. Um, for our audience, could you just describe in very broad terms what the situation is? Well, there aren't any human rights, to put, blunt, put it bluntly. North Korea is a totalitarian